Bienvenidos, gracias por estar aquí with another episode of Que Onda. I'm Dr. Mari Castañeda, where we come together and have conversations with scholars and local community activists and community members about the various things that they're doing uh, and the issues that they're addressing in their particular areas of work um, and, you know, uh, activism. And today we have uh, assistant professor Christian Guzman, who is at, in the civil and environmental engineering uh, department at UMass Amherst. And I'm really, really excited to hear more about the work that he's doing, uh, particularly because I'm not very familiar with it, but I'm really interested in hearing more about what exactly he does with regards to soil, water, and community. So, gracias, Cristian, for being here. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'm really happy to be here. Thank Absolutely, and, and I, I, pre I know you're busy, so I appreciate <laughs> you making the time. Um, of so, of course, I'm, I really want to talk about this idea of the intersection between communities and soil and water, mm -hmm. because for me, when I think about soil and water, that makes sense, and then even water and communities, but the triad of the three of them, uh, I'm fascinated to see and yeah. to hear more about how do you bring those two or those three things together. Yeah. Um, but before we jump into that, I actually wanted you to share first, how, how did you come to where you're at? And, and not, not just your position, but just yeah. in terms of your, your area of study, given everything you could have done. Yeah. What's your trajectory been like? Yeah. I'm I'm really grateful um, just for kind of all the people that have come before me and all the people that have um, created a path for me to get to where I am. And I think I would be remiss if I didn't bring some of those up. Uh, first and foremost is my family. Um, my family is from Ecuador, mm -hmm. so Guayaquil specifically. They moved here in the 80s. My brother and I were born in New York City. They got tired of the cold. It's way too cold in New York City. <laughs> it's cold here, but yeah, New York yeah. City is, for people from a warm climate, is very, very uh, cold. So they moved down to Florida, and that's kind of where the whole network of, like, Ecuadorians who left that wanted to be warmer came and settled down. So um, my mother was really into education. They both didn't get a chance to finish uh, mm -hmm. high school. So in they Ecuador. Were in Ecuador, yeah, yeah. because they... they um, for different reasons. My dad was into politics. My mother, you know, left early, and so... Um, they really wanted us to get an education. And so she was always like just the network of different Latinos in, you know, Kissimmee, Orlando, just like figuring out what are resources, after school programs, summer programs. And um, she just really found those things that we can get involved in. And my dad was a construction worker and he was always like, you're not going to do this. Mm. Like this is he's retired now at 63 he has to retire. His body's kind of just like, mm -hmm. you know, uh, accumulation of all that energy and labor. So he's like, you guys have to do something with your brain, not with your hands. Mm -hmm. And um, how many siblings do you have? I have one older brother and two younger sisters. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, he was really um, just motivated to push us out to get like, mm -hmm. you know, definitely our high school diploma and as much as possible, some college degree. Mm -hmm. He didn't care what it was, but he's like, I have to have. At the time, it was just three of us. A sister came like 20 years later, mm -hmm. but he was um, like, I want three diplomas on my wall. Aww. And so now it'll be four. But yeah. at the time, we always just remember growing up, he would say, I want three diplomas on my wall. Mm -hmm. And um, so I got a chance to go to the University of Florida. And at the time, I was interested in math and science. I didn't know which one to go into. And um, somebody just said... <clears throat> well, how, how did you get interested in math and science? Yeah, I, I have to say it wasn't like you know one discrete moment yeah. it was kind of just as a very very young kid my dad did a lot when we were little to like quiz us on math hmm. and I don't know if it's just like you know maybe he couldn't quiz us on Shakespeare and all these other <laughs> things but there was something that uh, he really oh, math is a universal language yes you know <laughs> it's just numbers you know yeah. and so he would uh, my brother and I would get like quizzed on our math time tables in like third grade um, just really pushing us, uh, you know, for that aspect of it. And I think it just stuck. I think that kind of like, um, you know, numbers and, and feeling the flow of things going from one to the end. Um, he, yeah, I think it just it just happened over time. And it always felt to me a little bit like uh, it was the most intuitive thing to follow. Mm -hmm. It seemed like there were steps to go from A to B to C in math or science, mm -hmm. as long as you learn the steps. Whereas I do have to say, now that I'm a professor, I kind of get more like English and humanities and social sciences, which you know a lot more about. But at the time, I think 
maybe our parents really didn't have that ability to guide us in that. Mm -hmm. So anytime I learned something new, I felt like people are making things up. Like there's interpretations and anyone has any interpretation and I can't find like where I can put my interpretation. Mm. And uh, later I've learned that, yeah, and that's that's the beauty of it. That's mm -hmm. how you can actually contribute your own perspective. Mm. But I think at a young age, it was it was hard to kind of just try mm -hmm. and like think that you could figure it out or, you know, not fail. So I think it felt more intuitive. And I just said, I'm going to stick with that. Um, and around high school time, it, it comes time to like, now you have to decide what is your major going to be. And um, somebody was like, if you don't know, just try engineering. And I was like, what's an engineer? Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, it doesn't, I mean, I've heard of it, but I don't know what they do. And who was this person that? <clears throat> yeah, so I was in the, um, the IB program, International Baccalaureate program. Mm -hmm. And so every now and then they would give us like assigned mentors and they would also just have like professors that are, you know, helping people in their 11th and 12th grade. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, figure out what it sounds like they're saying that they like and what it sounds like they kind of know um, degree programs offer. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really good at math. I knew I was really good at math. But at the time, I didn't know what a math person did after they got their degree. Mm -hmm. Now I know anything, basically, right? Mm -hmm. You can get one degree in something and do anything you want. Um, but at the time, I was like, I don't, I don't want to be a, just somebody who studies math all day long. I want like a job. I want, you know, money. Yeah. And um, so it's like an engineer, you know, engineers can work in consulting. They can work in, you know, building rockets. They can, there's just like the engineer is the concept of how to use the ideas. You can apply it in like so many different fields. Mm. And I, I went to the University of Florida, which is one of the biggest schools um, that offers engineering programs in the South, um, specifically in Florida. My parents were very like, you know, you're going to stay in this mm -hmm. this state as close as possible. Mm -hmm. And so it was Florida State University, University of Florida, University of Miami, um, and several other ones that had like different programs. And this one just worked out that it was going to be giving the best, you know, for what I wanted. And the, the thing that's great about those institutions that are so big is that they have a lot of opportunities to explore. But when you're a high school student, you're like, do I want to be an aerospace engineer, an electrical engineer, a computer engineer, environmental engineer? And it's just like, wow, there's 10 different programs. Which one should I dedicate my life to? Mm -hmm. And um, I just stuck with one that was top of the list, agricultural and biological engineering. <laughs> it's, it's alphabetical. <laughs> and I was like, if I, if I had to switch, it seems like the first two years are the same anyway. So I'll do that. And I, I had I had a really but good, you had some interest. I had some interest because yeah. agriculture. My dad has always talked about like, you know, he loves El Campo. He loves yeah. just like we would visit Ecuador every now and then, and just see. He he would always kind of like put the seed in my head like agropecuarios. Like mm -hmm. if you learn about soil water, like in construction, we were seeing the transformation of these meadows, just like forest. Everything. So I could kind of, I could see and familiarize myself with that, whereas rockets or electrical things were very interesting, but I, I kind of felt that I had to do a lot more to get into that. And yeah, so just in terms of that collectiveness or that understanding that seemed kind of far away versus yeah. much more intimate. Yeah, and, yeah. and it, it was, it was you know, intriguing, and I, I, I think I listed it down to like five, but I was like, let me start here. And, you know, computers are really cool, and maybe I'll switch to that. Um, and over time, I tried to a couple of times. I was thinking, like, I don't know if this agriculture biological thing is for me. Um, and a counselor or a, a advisor was like, why don't you just take the intro classes? Right now, you're taking calculus, chemistry, physics, and you're seeing all these other people get, like, different opportunities. They're in the junior and senior year. You should take one of these intro classes. And I took the intro to ag and bioengineering. And that's why I learned about land and water resource engineering. So it's one of the sub-specializations of the department. Sometimes you don't see on the department, like, you know, title, what's all the programs they offer. And land and water resource engineering was something that I felt really called to me. Like, I was very interested just from my dad's construction experiences with how is it that we're altering, you know, the surface of, you know, where we're all living we're creating these structures, they're great, they're magnificent. But I was curious, like, what happens to, you know, the environment? Like, what are we doing to the environment? We have rivers, we have lakes. Um, 
And so I felt like this could like bridge what my dad wanted me to do, which was like go construction management. He's like, do construction management. When you graduate, we're just going to go build houses and do all this stuff. And what I thought maybe I could kind of contribute to, but still do some kind of like construction adjacent work. And I got a research internship to study soil and water infiltration um, through different structures in Florida that we have. Like here in, in hilly areas, it's kind of natural that things flow and they go into rivers. In Florida, everything's flat. Mm. So so when you say structures, what do you mean specifically? So like, like even from here down to the canal, mm -hmm. there's an incline. Here in Holyoke. Holyoke, mm -hmm. yeah. In most of places in the northeast or the north or wherever there's like this, like, you know, mountainous terrain, there's an incline. So naturally, you know, things are by gravity going towards whatever the nearest you know ravine is or stream or lake mm -hmm. um, in cities they'll usually have storm drains so at the edge of the road you can see it either goes into a pipe or on the side of the road there's like just some thing that helps you know um, take the water down um, these different things are ways that we've organized you know cities so that water doesn't stay in a particular way mm -hmm. in florida because it's flat there has to be a little bit more management when it rains that it doesn't just kind of f flood everywhere mm. and so they do divert these things they have gravity but then they put them into what's called infiltration basin or a detention basin and every now and then you'll see them here um, but it's just land that they've cleared out they've dug a hole and then either it does have stand can be like a natural ecosystem or it's just empty mm -hmm. and water goes in there when a huge event comes the calculation is such that over 72 hours it should all go away so it's the way of managing how we've mm -hmm. taken all this which used to be natural landscape it had a regular infiltration pattern it had a regular like conveyance pattern and how do we kind of retain on average what it used to be doing before mm -hmm. we've put mm -hmm. you know roads and buildings and, th and that is all engineered that's all engineered, okay. yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so this internship then worked with um, a researcher who went and tried to see, like, we created all of these years and years ago. How many of these are actually still doing the job mm -hmm. in the way that we calculated them to, to be doing mm -hmm. originally? And it was highly variable. Like, organic rich soils, which had high infiltration capacity, still functioned pretty close. But if you put a certain soil type that was like clay or another type that was a little bit more um, dense particles that were very, very compacted, it was actually not performing well. And was, know, that, was that happening because it got brought in from somewhere else or it, nat naturally kind of changed over time? Or yeah, like what, it's, what is it's it interesting. Some, some, of the these, some of these is just by, um, you know, there's regulations, dig this hole, make it this big. This is the calculation of water that needs to go. And then it's kind of, I've learned over time, things are designed in one place, then subcontracted to somewhere else, then subcontracted to somebody else. Mm. And so it all kind of depends on if the original intention got all the way through that line. Uh -huh. And then also, like you said, natural processes. Some of these places that ended up having high infiltration rate was based on like just the regeneration of certain plants into those infiltration basins you know, ants, all these different things started to change the nature, they created more organic matter, and that had a natural change that was beneficial. Some of these places never received that. So it was kind of the original soil texture, the original vegetation, and it kind of over time just filled with, you know, storm-driven deposition of little particles. Mm -hmm. So this actually changed the nature like of that. Like rocks and sand. Rocks, and sand, anything from the street, yeah, like debris. Um, and it kind of like, you think that the soil is going to be how you designed it. Mm -hmm. But over time, it's getting like compacted. It's getting filled. So like this matrix, like a sponge mm. of just like, you know, soil surface or soil subsurface is supposed to function one way. And then imagine you just fill the sponge all the holes with different things. So it becomes more compact. It becomes more compact. Yeah. And um, that was the difference between a lot of these places. Mm. Like they had a lot of this influence, just like of road debris or something else that just came in naturally. Does that then lead to a lot of flooding? Then that's the issue is that yeah. this is supposed to prevent 
you know, the flooding because it's supposed to retain water mm -hmm. and then, you know, hopefully... Ever, you know, 72 hours, as you mentioned. Yes, yeah, so there's idea. some, some you know, different regulation, but some time frame in which, you know, it's going to be there, but then it should naturally infiltrate mm -hmm. away. Um, so what, th does this fascinate you? Like when you were doing this internship, like what was it about that that you were like, oh my gosh. In hindsight, it's very amazing and fascinating. During <laughs> the time that I was doing it, um, I would say that getting paid was amazing. <laughs> And yes, uh, <laughs> it was like Especially eight dollars. Especially an undergraduate, right? <laughs> it, it is the thing is like I had like a heavy engineering load. I was like really involved in just different clubs, ships, Society of Hispanic Professional Engineers, um, a lot of different organizations. And so this opportunity to, you know, get paid to do something that's similar to my classwork was really exciting. And beyond getting paid, I would say that I was really into doing like laboring, like. Mm -hmm. My dad was a, you know, construction painter, but he was just a handyman. Like we fixed stuff all the time. We changed toilets, um, <clears throat> windows, anything that broke, like we did it. We didn't call somebody else to do it. Mm. And so as a kid, we wanted to play outside and it's like, no, we have to fix this thing. And over time, like I really did, I learned to like that stuff. And so this was field work. Mm. This was field work, going out, grabbing soil sand, working like six, seven, eight hours in the field. It felt like really enriching um, to go and do something and then have something done. Like mm -hmm. today we're going to sample three infiltration basins. We're going to take nine um, infiltrometer tests. We're going to take 30 soil samples. And it felt exciting to like go out, help this person who was like, you know, my supervisor and kind of like show that I could do all these things. It was, I think it was my first kind of, real experience into what land and water resource engineers do mm -hmm. and, and it's really um, embodied right yeah. I think material <laughs> and embodied in the ways in which you're engaging yes with, uh, your body itself yeah. with engaging yeah. in the space and land and so yeah. Forth. yeah and and i do have to say that uh, the um, experience encompassed some laboratory time mm. and i learned that i did not like laboratory okay. time <laughs> but in hindsight i love laboratory time mm -hmm. and it's kind of just like the new experiences that you are drawn towards that you naturally like are great, but also learning to see how those experiences connect with other things. Mm. So the laboratory part of it is we had all this soil, but you have to analyze it. You have to go and run it into some test or mix it up or find out like the particle size distribution. And I was like, I just want to be out and like do something. I want to put my headphones on. I want to just like zone out. And we had to be really, you know, attentive to detail. Everything had a step. We didn't move more than like the entire bench space for like a whole six or seven hours. Mm -hmm. And I, at that time, I was like, I don't think this is for me because it's exciting to sample in the summer, but now the semesters, right? The researcher is doing things, writing grants. You know, he has to be at his office. I have to be the person who's self-directed in the lab. And um, I thought about leaving. I was like, let me just. Let me let me stick it out, and um, I st I stuck it out. We got more kind of out outdoor and then lab experiences, and I kind of did start to see it's like oh I mean, you can't just sample things like you need to know like what's the result, mm -hmm. and that's when I kind of started to see like what the whole scientific endeavor is. So you start moving over from just simply being like what I call data rich. But moving toward you know because we could be data rich but knowledge poor yes right exactly but you start like moving into the direction of like yeah. data rich and knowledge rich exactly you know, by that analysis the, yeah and um i i i think he was just one of the the best mentors i've ever had mm -hmm. eben bean is his name assistant professor uh, extension now at university of florida he went to east carolina state university and then he went back to uf um and he really he and a couple other people are really how I've modeled my own mentoring style. Mm. He was just around and kind of did this, uh, I don't know if they call it Socratic, but like asking in a way of like, I know you're not gonna get the answer right, but I wanna see what answer you give. Mm. And then I'm gonna kind of dialogue with how I think it could be in another space. Mm. And so we did like truck rides out to Tallahassee, Gainesville, different places. And he kind of just talked to me about like, what is it that I wanted to do? and. Uh, you know, where are the places that I saw myself going? And mm. I really didn't have somebody to talk with about that. Mm. Um, you know, my parents were like, you didn't get your degree and then move back to Kissimmee, and that's where the rest of your life is going to start. And I started feeling more and more like, you see your peers, and they're saying, oh, I'm going to go to this place, I'm going to go to that place, I'm going to get my graduate degree, I'm going to go to law school. And I was like, I, 
think I'm going to go to a construction firm. I'm not sure. And he really, you know, was asking me, like, you know, what do you think about this process that's happening? Or how do you interpret this or that? And um, I, I also was with other colleagues, and they were like, you know, I'm going to master's, I'm going to PhD. And I started to think, maybe I should go for a, a master's or a PhD. And he was one of the people, which surprisingly, um, at the time, he said, um, don't just get a PhD because people are telling you to mm. or people are saying that they're getting one. Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. a big investment in your time and you should know that you want to do it. Because mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, it's tough. It's tough. <laughs> it's and tough. I think that's the thing yeah. is he was, he was operating from a, a very, like, you know, authentic part of saying, like, I'm going, you know, I'm going through it or I've been through it. And um, not that it's not for everyone. I think it is for everyone. Mm -hmm. But you also should be when the tough moments are happening, mm -hmm. know what it's for. Mm -hmm. And sometimes if you haven't quite decided what it's for, you know, that can lead you maybe in different paths. And mm -hmm. if you do know what it's for, then you can decide, yes, I'm gonna keep going, or you know what, I can get what I wanted outside of a PhD. Mm -hmm. But having that like, you know, n understanding why you're doing it is, is really fascinating to think about when you're 22. I didn't mm -hmm. really have that, but I, I um and it really is central because because it is it is tough getting that just a master's but certainly the PhD and doing yeah. all that research and that yeah. work and there's moments where you're not going the way that you think it's going to go and then yeah. sometimes you're not even close to your families I mean there's so many exactly. a, you know aspects of it so being very clear about <laughs> your purpose and your direction is the place where you can go to when the going gets tough yes you know and you can kind of get centered again of like yeah. why did I choose this path yeah and and I had actually some PhD offers, and I had um, two MS offers, and um, I actually because of this conversation consultation, all the other professors said do a PhD, mm -hmm. all my other colleagues do a PhD. He was the only one that said only do it if you really know you want to do it, and I didn't know, mm -hmm. and I decided um, I had an offer uh, at Cornell, and they were like we can only give you PhD funding, and I said um, I only want to do an, a master's, and. Mm -hmm. It, it figured out that they worked it out. I, I got there on a master's. I was only going to do a master's. And like many other people, I'm not sure if you had this, but a lot of people said, for sure, I'm not doing a PhD. I'm only doing a master's. And I actually went straight to the PhD. You did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, and I, I learned did. a lot of people did. Yeah. And, and, and just because it's, it just worked out in my case yeah. as well because of the program and you know, what I wanted to do and the funding and all the pieces kind of. But But it's true. Inside of me, there was still a little bit of like, Am I going to be okay? Am yeah. I going to be able to be successful? Is this is this going to be a place that that welcomes me as well? There were all these other questions because the same thing being first gen and not knowing what that whole graduate experience yeah. is like entirely. You sort of see when you're undergraduate in those spaces with your professors and other graduate students, but you really don't know until you're the one that's really there. Yeah, and also I think it can range, right? Like you hear of people doing mm -hmm. PhD programs are three years or four. Mm -hmm. And then you hear of sometimes people have done seven, eight, nine, and you're like hearing this at 22, you're like, I thought I was done with school. Mm -hmm. I'll just do one more or maybe I'll do two more years. I definitely can't commit to five or six. And so um, I was sure I wasn't going to do it. And I just started and I was excited. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh my gosh, this is done in one year. You know, mm -hmm. like you get there and basically you're learning how to be a graduate student for a semester. Then maybe you decide your program and your project. And then it's a year and then you got to start it all over again. What's the job search? Mm -hmm. And I was fortunate that I got fellowships to stay and it was really now that was the kind of like the, mm -hmm. the crossroads. Like if you take this fellowship for three or four years, you got to stay, you got to get the PhD. Mm -hmm. If you don't, your life starts now, like in the professional sense. Mm -hmm. You gotta go out, gotta go back to Florida, stay in New York. Um, and I decided, let me figure out what this PhD thing is because I really know that I love research mm -hmm. and I really know I'm inspired by the ability of research to make change in different people's mm -hmm. lives and aspects. Mm -hmm. At the time, the fellowships were to go to Ethiopia and Kenya to do research wow. on soil and water issues. Mm -hmm. Originally, I had thought like I was gonna go to Ecuador or someplace in Latin America or even um, I had a French minor because of IB mm -hmm. that I ended up taking more classes in, in undergrad. And I was like, I can go to West Africa or some French speaking place mm -hmm. as well. Um, but these fellowships were now to go to Ethiopia. And I was like, okay, let me, let me go ahead and try this. 
and um, that's when I I did the PhD. I did this amazing project with people working in Bahadar, Ethiopia. I did get an experience later in Colombia, and after that, again, it, it kind of comes to like you get to this point where like now what? I think that's been my thing. It's like mm -hmm. I get to the end, and it's you know, just good mentors or good colleagues are like. You know, I think we see you kind of going into this space. Mm -hmm. And at, at that time, people were saying, like, professors. Professors basically do what you're doing, but now they're, like, managing it. Mm -hmm. They're saying, we're going to do it here, we're going to do it there. This, mm -hmm. is the, this is the structure we're going to use. This is the framework we're going to approach. These are the disciplines we're going to interact with. Mm -hmm. And um, that's when kind of I saw that my professor at Cornell, like, he created all these projects by having, like, his students, his postdocs, mm -hmm. everyone doing that stuff. But he was really connected to all these different projects and mm -hmm. conceptualizing just like how things should be approached. And um, and, and how yeah. do you see both, I mean, that trajectory that then in the work that you're doing, like, what are you hoping it, it does? Like, what is it that you're, you know, like, what is it that, yeah. that inspired both the movement in that trajectory, but then ultimately like the kind of work that you do and the research that you do what do you, I mean, and I'm, I'm assuming the, uh, those experiences both in Ethiopia and Colombia were like inspiring and incredible and, and wonderful, right? That yeah. sort of see my, even the global impact yeah. of the work that you're doing. Um, so what is a, how do you see that intersection that we were talking earlier right. about soil communities and water, ultimately, you know, that, um, you know, the, the kind of thing that you want to kind of put out there. Yeah, the I, uh, it's, it's, it's funny that um, I kind of arrived at the graduate experience and I said, uh, look at these books. We had a huge like library and I was like, the answer is here somewhere. Like you just mm -hmm. have to like spend the time in these stacks mm -hmm. and find it. There's books here from the fifties, like the sixties, the thirties, whatever. You just have like we're not looking at it, you know. Mm. We we gotta figure it out. And over time I saw that like um wait a second, we know how to do this. We figured out the science. So really, it's kind of like, have people decided to implement something in a certain place? Mm. And if not, why not? Mm. So mm. some of the reasons were logistical aspects, like mm -hmm. in the mountains of Ethiopia, mountains of Colombia, they're very hard to reach. Mm -hmm. Some of them could be sociopolitical, maybe the people who would benefit from this issue uh, that we're solving, um, you know, they're not in the appropriate kind of political scheme that's important or not. And then in some those of it in those in particular the, spaces, in those particular right? Yeah. Spaces, mm -hmm. you know, whether in you know, um, developed world or developing countries, um, and I started to see that there was a lot more behind the scenes than just like going in and calculating things. And even when I was interested in like, okay, engineers without borders or these programs that kind of like NGOs go in, do something, come back out, I I did like, just, well, why isn't this solved? It seems like we've been doing these NGO things since like 80s and the 90s mm -hmm. and the more I saw was the collaboration and, and kind of coordination between whatever the community wanted or did um, previous to this you know outside group coming in um, how they were consulted how it was organized and then how you know whatever happened when people left mm. all of that played a role in whether the issue was solved or not mm -hmm. so degradation you know water purification getting groundwater from beneath the soil so it becomes also the intersections of the social political economic cultural context yeah. that shapes a lot of that as well yeah you and know, ultimately and I, I think eventually my advisor kind of like saw that's the path that was going he's like yeah you're not going to solve anything in any of these places unless you talk to the people on the ground. Mm. And he really, um, you know, pushed me and a couple other people to get people on our um, dissertation committee that were in development sociology, mm. anthropology, um, different uh, people that he had interacted with and collaborated with. Different and scholars. Different right. scholars, yeah. yeah. And um, that that actually is like one kind of, you know, theme of his research is that interdisciplinary work. And um, it's very difficult if, mm -hmm. if you're not kind of like inclined to it, like I said, mm -hmm. um, or if like I just spent, you know, high school science and math, college science and math and engineering, and then get here and somebody is like, now you have to know this whole other discipline. And um, it was a little intimidating, you know, some of the things that social scientists or humanities 
talk about or read like just seeing some of their classes like oh we're gonna read these four books like read the four books <laughs> what like we read papers you know yeah. and I think it's just ingrained that um you know the volume of literature you need to intake is a little mm, bit different mm -hmm. and and yet it's so important if if you want to not only do the work well but if you really are wanting to impact in a positive way communities in sort of the sort of environmental context in which you're operating it becomes like really important definitely right? yes you know, there's, there's no other yes. way yeah and um that was exciting to kind of get challenged by eventually i learned i don't have to have a whole another degree i just have to be open to understanding these mm -hmm. different frameworks and really collaborate well mm -hmm. with the other person from the other discipline so yeah. it's not about you know getting a whole another set of skills that replaces your current skills it's about if you're able to now intersect with mm -hmm. and dialogue with and have enough understanding of the other fields to be able to see where the connections are mm -hmm. and um I think that just stuck with me and, and um, I learned in Ethiopia and in Colombia that um, a lot of the ways things get initiated was from the ground up and learning how to work within you know knowledge systems that people use so mm -hmm. either the language that they use or the actual classification scheme we did a project where they talked about the soil degradation in terms of the color um, black soil you know was very fertile brown soil was less fertile and then like the white soils were the least fertile and so crops were planted in these different areas based on that mm -hmm. which actually aligns well with in our classification scheme like nidosols, vertosols, you know other sandy soils and so you know the use was more important than the actual like hydraulic properties mm -hmm. but it all was related because you know well water retention, nutrient retention, soils were the places that they put their highest value crops. Mm -hmm. The ones that were still important but didn't satu but oversaturated and caused flooding, they didn't plant their high value crops. And mm -hmm. so that's where we learned like we can actually kind of map out erosion. Mm -hmm. in well, it sounds like, I mean, the community has a lot of knowledge. They had a lot of knowledge. Right? And how do you bring that into exactly. bear in that conversation? And, and that's analysis. where a development sociologist, anthropologist kind of like said, like, don't just go with, you know, this is good, that's bad. This mm -hmm. is bad, this is good. Mm -hmm. um, because people have a reason behind why they do what they do. And, and probably and generations. Generations. Right? <laughs> and that's generations the important of thing like is like, of work, yeah. you know, we come in with one or two years of funding, mm -hmm. maybe five. And we do a project, we analyze things, we have different methods. But people are there like living generations, mm -hmm. you know, hundreds of years. And they're like, we don't want to do that thing you recommended. Like, we mm -hmm. know what happens mm -hmm. in this season and that season. And mm -hmm. um, that was exciting to bring together. I, I, um, I got an experience from the anthropologist in learning how to run focus group discussions, mm -hmm. transect walks, take um, the, the transcriptions from these and put them into, you know, again academic language because mm -hmm. that's that's how we move forward in our careers but um, just that whole experience really opened my eyes to a lot of this mm -hmm. interdisciplinary stuff and is there a way to also um, make that knowledge available like kind of like reflect back with the community to yeah be able to share back <coughs> so it's it's not just at the academic exactly, le yeah. level but then also so part of engaging working with the anthropologist did kind of take me through like these steps of learning how to design it implement it we did you know, um, age and gender differentiated, and then also once you have your preliminary results, take it back and confirm mm -hmm. with the group that you worked with. Like mm. these are the summaries that I came up with across these different groups. Mm -hmm. um, is this what it sounds like you were trying to convey? Mm -hmm. And um, we had we had an interesting experience because we always had to do this in the communities we were working with on days that they either were not going to the field, not going to the market, and not in church. Mm -hmm. And so we, we didn't get like all the groups together to say every single thing, but we got mm -hmm. enough to say, it sounds like, yes, that's that's you know the interaction that we had, it's the, um, the message we wanted to convey. Mm -hmm. But I, I do think there's kind of a, a missing arm where mm. it's like, then you go out and kind of make that happen. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes these projects, you write the paper, you get your PhD, and then you kind of go on to the new thing. Um, there, fortunately, between Bahardar and Cornell, they had this program where 
there's capacity building mm -hmm. so that Bahadur University now has a master's program, it has a PhD program, and they can continue that work locally mm -hmm. and make it actually kind of more projects, mm -hmm. more rehabilitation efforts. And so that's exciting to see. I think in the U.S. we kind of try to do that with extension. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I, that going back to the community and talking with them was definitely something the, the, the collaborators I had with, um, you know, said was very important and, and definitely impactful. What is what does your family think of the work that you do in terms of? I mean, yeah. going going back to like, I mean, originally, of course, you're not only did, was your dad sort of thinking about like, oh, it'd be great for you to be in construction, you know, yeah, you're nearby, yeah. but also just like in terms of being near, given that you're now in Massachusetts, um, and so I'm sure you visit. But but what are they? How do they like? How have they responded? Yeah, I would say they're very very supportive of seeing what I'm doing, mm -hmm. and excited for me to be making all this, you know. Impact, uh, but I would say every phone call and every visit yeah. is, so when are you moving back down? I know, <laughs> I know what you mean. Um, my family in Los Angeles is the same way. <laughs> so yeah, and I, and I, and my, you know, my, my heart, you know, just gets pierced every time because that is kind of what I want to do. I do want to be back, like, with my family. I do want to be, you know, just going to every single birthday. There's, like, now that we're, like, three or four generations down, it's, like, a birthday every month or every week, mm -hmm. and you just say pictures on the WhatsApp, it's just like, you know, it's this person's birthday. I know, 25 you FaceTime faces. como no trabaja. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You put it and like, hey, say hi. It's like everybody's yelling and they're <laughs> kind of there just watching. Um, so they're really supportive, but they also would really prefer yeah. if I was back down there. Um, but I, I would say at the beginning that was a little bit more strong and they wouldn't really kind of understand what I'm doing. And then just... Over the years, I, I would try and I would just say, oh, I'm, I'm going to Ethiopia for the summer project to do this, or I'm going to go live there for eight months. I'm going to Colombia for seven months. Um, and then, you know, it's just that dialogue back and forth and saying, mm -hmm. oh, I'm studying soil erosion. I had to learn all these words in Spanish, mm -hmm. like all these scientific words in Spanish to tell my, my parents mm -hmm. um, how to, again, say it to my brother and sister, mm -hmm. tell them. And over time, people ask them, what is your brother doing? Or what is your son doing? Mm -hmm. And then they would say it. So like that they kind of like... They can communicate it They can well. communicate it. Yeah. And, and over time, they are as kind of, you know, knowledgeable as like, you know, anyone here about what I'm doing. Yeah. Like they know I study soil and water resources. I do it in international settings. I work with sometimes communities. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, they're really proud of me. They're really excited. Uh, but I would say, I was just talking to my brother on the way up here. I told him we're going to do a podcast. And we listen to, po everybody listens to podcasts. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he was just like, uh, we were joking. And then he's like, uh, yeah, he just, you know, he's always, you know, talking about the next time we're going to come down or mm -hmm. like, what are we going to do? And so, I yeah, know what you mean. It's because a I mean, I mean, being a, yeah, exactly. I mean, coming from Los Angeles and, and I've been at UMass for now, I'm entering my 25th year. Yeah. You know, and, and that's, so that's like, you know, 3,000 miles away. <laughs> and so I never imagined I would be that far away for that long. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the other thing that's made a difference for me is is the constant going back and forth. Mm -hmm. You know, I developed this uh, sort of lifestyle or way of being in the world and identity of being very bicoastal. Mm -hmm. um, that actually was really wonderful because um, there was a sabbatical that I spent there. Yeah. And my family was so busy. Oh, right. I, they were actually that's super, right. super busy. So yeah. I was like, okay, so this is what it was all would be like <laughs> yeah, yeah. if I was here all the time too. Mm -hmm, it's not mm -hmm. as if every single weekend, right. right? I mean, certainly there's lots of events happening, but there's also a lot of, a lot of things that they're really busy with too. Yeah, and so they have their own lives. Yeah. They have their own schedule. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. so it just, I just realized like, okay, so I, I'll get there when really the really important stuff mm -hmm. that's really happening mm -hmm. for me to make that weekend trip or yeah. make that week long yeah. trip. And, and I really did commit myself to that yeah. and saying like, I will do everything I can to be there for th that thing that happens. And that is the thing that has transformed, Yeah, you know, um, because even recently I was talking to my sister when I was back in California and she's like, I can't believe you're going to be there 25 years. It still doesn't feel like it doesn't feel that long. Yeah. And um, and I'm like, you're right. Right. She's like, yeah, because it feels like and I think because we see you all the time. Yeah. Like there's there seems to be like every three months you're here or every four months. And it, again, it may not be for an extended period, but it's enough mm -hmm. to make that connection. Be connected. Yeah. yeah. That then and they have also traveled out here yeah. as well. And that's made a huge difference. Yeah. 
And then there's been also times where they've even come to conferences with me. Oh, that's Like amazing. if I was like in that's California, exciting. there was a conference. One time I was a, giving, a, uh, giving a talk at a conference in Arizona. My siblings all drove down mm. to see me. Uh, it was really great. <laughs> it was really wonderful to spend time with them. I, and for them to see me in action. Yeah. Because they were like, you know, I... It was just wonderful to see them there, uh, you know, seeing me speak, but also understanding what yeah, I was talking yeah. about on some level. Uh, but then also afterwards, we're like, I, I actually disagree. Like we had discussions yeah. and it was like really great, you know, to be able to talk about like that. I have to say that uh, I really love that you do that and I'm really inspired. And I, um, I met you in my first year. Whenever I get any new space, new like place that I'm working in, I'm, I'm like, I need to feel comfortable. And part of feeling comfortable is knowing like the lay of the land and understanding <laughs> who's here. <laughs> and uh, I, I think I just kind of like snowballed. I was like, you know, who else should I talk to? Who? And I think I went to CMAS first and they're like, oh, you should learn about clackles. You should learn about this thing, ship, blah, blah, blah. And um Somehow I, you know, I came upon, upon your name and I re reached out to you and you said, sure, come to my office. And it was like amazing. We sat down and talked and you told me that you do this. And I was like, so amazed. <laughs> I felt so validated because I, I, you know, I've had different experience with different peers that are like they've left the home and they don't want to go back. You know, everybody has different experiences. Yeah, Not everyone has, you know, the same positive um, relationships. family dynamics. Yeah, yeah. And, um, I kind of learned one way or another is like kind of a a weird thing that I keep wanting to go back. But then I meet people like you and also other people from different cultures like, no, like we go back every, you know, this month or, you know, every December. And I saw you at, you know, your stage still making it a real big priority. Absolutely. And I was like, Mm -hmm. that's very cool to see that you can do that you and can decide like, exactly. to make that intentional part of your schedule absolutely because otherwise everything else takes up your schedule yeah exactly exactly and the other thing too is that it's not like you don't want to go home right because yeah. i the same thing that pull to los angeles to california it is deep yeah and it's like it feels like a gravitational force yeah, yeah. like it's like <laughs> you know like right here in your heart right so you just like feel it and at the same time you also love the work that you do yes. and yeah. so committed to mm -hmm. it and you spend so much time and energy in it. Um, and you know that over time your family does value it as well totally. and value you mm -hmm. and what you're doing. Yeah. And so it also has to be like the right position, right? Mm -hmm. It has to be the right institution mm -hmm. that's also supporting you in that way. It has to be the, the kind of community-based engaged work, whether it's local or mm -hmm. global, that makes a lot of sense for yeah. you, right? Because otherwise, it feels forced yeah and um and then it, it doesn't give you the kind of depth and the kind of joy and excitement that you need for the work and so for me that's been an important part as well yeah where I, it's it's not like there aren't opportunities but sometimes it's like but is it the right one that yeah. really allows me to do the things i need to do because i have to say i've been so happy both at the university my department of course um but also in the broader community here in mm -hmm. western massachusetts mm -hmm. with a lot of collaborators collaborators and in Holyoke in particular and also Springfield that have really welcomed me in, in like as la comunidad mm -hmm. and and that's made a big difference yeah. because then I feel like as well that I have multiple homes and multiple communities that yeah. I get to be a part of and so I, I want to be able to um, to be in both pa places in mm -hmm. many ways because those yeah. roots have also been you know really really wonderful to have to yes grow. yes and um we have the five colleges here, mm -hmm. which is like just really amazing. Uh, my wife works at Amherst College, Jaquina Guzman. She's That's in right. be mm -hmm. behavioral economics, and she just loves that institution. It's like small liberal arts college, mm -hmm. but you know the people that go there are really motivated to be in that space as educators, as like building an intellectual community. We have UMass, we have Hampshire College, Smith. Um, and then so many uh, wonderful Holyoke. other like collaborator colleges yeah. around the area and universities yeah. as well. Yeah, and so that that also kind of um, when you think about different spaces to be in, it's like Boston, I guess, has a lot of yeah. institutions mm -hmm. as well. But um, mm -hmm. there's, there's something nice about this little kind of like space, Enclave Amherst, that has yeah. these different institutions, people working, and we do have Holyoke, you know, mm -hmm. nearby. It's oh, a place yeah. that. I come and I get Cuban sandwiches, I get cafe, I've gotten haircuts here, yeah. <laughs> and it feels like parts of Kissimmee. It feels like um, oh, yeah, know, a connection. Oh, yeah, they're like in so many ways. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so, yeah, there are these places where you can still kind of be, you know, a reminder of your 
your culture and your community um, that you and, and to be part like. of it too in yeah. some ways that yeah. make a big difference mm -hmm. so I know our time is starting to wrap up okay. and so I <laughs> also wanted to ask you about like so the future direction of your work or yeah. where do you see the importance of those intersections of soil communities and and water given also like climate change mm. and the climate really cl crisis that's mm -hmm. happening in mm -hmm. so many communities being impacted particularly everyone's talking about soil erosion yeah. right now on the, not just on the coast but even inland you know mm. in terms of what's happening with different places and yeah. kind of like the importance of understanding the land yeah um and so how, how do you see your own work kind of moving in sort of a, a particular trajectory and in, in its contributions in those areas yeah i think um it's it's kind of an interesting space to be in because um you know i was intrigued about this stuff in you know my undergraduate career but i didn't quite have a feel for how important it was kind of globally mm. and recently we we have gotten you know more and more insights on how climate change will impact you know heavy rain volume so the yes. amount of volume that's falling and then also intensity so amount of volume that falls within a certain time frame and then seasonality so we benefit in in this part of you know the country from you know snow melt driven kind of hydrology where snow will deposit it kind of has time to get into the soil and then it slowly trickles out over time mm -hmm. the mountain west um, west coast as well they have that type of hydrological patterns if that snow now becomes all you know wet rain that just goes off faster that's changing the nature that our flows have in the summer mm -hmm. or different times of the year and if pollutants get in there if we have a certain volume that you know we're used to that naturally because of wastewater treatment plants or whatever there's different things going into that there's a dilution effect mm -hmm. now if that's changing because we have a shifting volume intensity or timing of the year we're going to have situations where we have a higher concentration of pollutants mm -hmm. at different times than we expected. Mm -hmm. And oh it's not so important. Like, <laughs> yeah, just like when you just described all of that, I was like, oh my gosh, like, yeah. there's a lot there. Yeah, you know, that and has to um, be I think hydrology is well, or hydrologists, water research engineers, environment engineers, really well positioned um, you know, to work on sustainability, but also to work on these issues that are intriguing intellectually, they have intellectual merit but I think are important just in the functioning of society. Mm -hmm. Just like I think sometimes we take it for granted that mm -hmm. it's very easy to turn on the tap and water's there, clean water. Um, but, you know, we learned that that took a lot of engineering, that took a lot of mm -hmm. um, science investment. And I think the important thing now is that, you know, our representatives, you know, in our state and many other states are pushing for more investment, mm -hmm. more scholarships, more training programs, more um, advancing people in STEM, and also STEAM, arts or interactions, collaborations with humanities and social sciences, mm -hmm. um, because this is stuff that we need for our society to thrive now and in the future. Mm -hmm. And I really, for my own lab, you know, apart from just I investigating these things, I'm really excited about bringing in um, just people from diverse backgrounds. Right now we have um, four students um, uh, f from L Louis Stokes Alliance from um, Alliance for Minority Participation in STEM. Mm -hmm. That's supporting uh, one of our scholars. We have the Sloan R Research Fellow Program, which is supporting black, Hispanic, and indigenous um, students. Mm. That's supporting one of our students. And then I have two paid students that are in civil engineering. And I really enjoy the aspect of having my graduate student, myself, mentor these students mm -hmm. so that they can go and get graduate degrees or they can go into consulting. So mm -hmm. I'm excited by the same type of experience that I got. I was just taking classes and somebody brought me into the lab, got me into the field. They're out now. This Saturday, they're going to go sample 13 sites for stable water isotopes to look at that change in wow. time mm -hmm. of the watershed capacity, mm -hmm. but also phosphorus temperature a lot of these different things just to get a feel for what's happening in our watershed here mm -hmm. so i really want to work towards you know these climate change water resource issues soil issues but also broadening participation for anybody who wants to study engineering and sciences mm -hmm. and giving that cohort i think that cohort effect or mm -hmm. that strong mentorship effect really makes a difference no, absolutely um, i mean what you're saying right now i was just thinking that mentoring that you received and that now you're passing on to your students yeah makes a huge difference where students feel valued 
they see they feel seen mm -hmm. um, but they feel like they're also making a contribution and that you're guiding that process of making that contribution that's really important for us to understand yeah. like what's happening with soil what's happening with water mm -hmm. because all those issues that you were describing um, I'm not a scientist in that same way but I can see like I'm like oh no this is really important yeah. because it's critical for us because if we don't have folks really looking at it more clear uh, carefully and closely how do we really understand what's taking place mm -hmm. how do we really address it when it's not working well you know, and how do we get our policymakers to really take that investment seriously? Yeah. Because yeah. there's a lot of disinvestment that's happened mm -hmm. over you know a very long time uh, in communities, particularly lower income communities, and mm -hmm. so forth. And so, how do we make sure that everyone gets included in this process, um, and those communities um, are seen as just as important to be invested in? Mm -hmm. You know, because are th are the future of you know what we're looking at, not just locally, but really in the state and, and beyond, yeah. you know, as well. Yeah. So I'm glad that you're, you're doing that with, their, with your students. And do you see them also kind of in that place where you were seeing yourself in the past when you were an undergraduate of like, is this the direction I want to go? <laughs> you know, like, is this, you know, or, or are you seeing a different kind of, because of the inc incredible importance of environmentalism and sustainability yeah. and, and the climate concerns that are also the younger generation really is really seeing? You know in some ways yeah it's interesting that our undergraduates i think are very interested in the kind of more well-known aspects of engineering so like structures and transportations you can mm -hmm. see that you know that people have built those our water resources engineering we are very very popular and well represented in like the graduate level aspect of research mm -hmm. and you know faculty going out to conferences mm -hmm. um but I think we're just now seeing the importance of like making that translate to the undergraduates as well and getting them mm. into the um, experience of you know undergraduate research mm -hmm. and what that can lead to. And I'm we're seeing. I'm going to to the Honors College. <laughs> we have uh, a pizza uh, and prof. You have to awesome! Come. I, I would be. <laughs> I would love it. it. Yeah, yeah. And I think I so. Think one of our one of our students is in the Honors College, mm. and uh, that's exciting that I've I've gotten these experiences to learn from the students themselves. Mm. So one is a sophomore in the Honors College, and mm -hmm. he is just you know, really ambitious, wanting to get out. And another is a sophomore in the Sloan Research uh, mm -hmm. Program, and then two are seniors. Mm -hmm. And I do have to say that um, understanding and navigating the kind of graduate, you know, career trajectory is, is n still not well described. Like yeah. learning about, you know, what is a funded program? What is a master's program? What is a PhD program? Who pays for it? When do you have to apply? I, I've been, you know, explaining it, giving them information, um, writing letters of recommendation. Mm -hmm. But I would say it's kind of um, a little bit more like they stumble yeah. kind of into it's it. It's very much a hidden curriculum. Yes, right? it is and very, so very much a hidden curriculum. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited that when I get to share about it. But, you know, we have a lot of workshops about it, but it kind of maybe doesn't align with certain people's schedules and mm -hmm. doesn't reach. We have email. I've sent out so many emails for so many things and really talking to people is what you know, it gets people to, yeah. to understand it. And well, and I think uh, also part of it, I mean, I experienced this as a, both an undergraduate um, and, and also as a graduate student is that when a faculty, you see stuff, but when a faculty member actually like really reaches out for you and yeah. says, no, 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 I really want you to par be part of this or I want you to participate, you really then say like, oh, they really think that I'm, I'm capable of doing yeah. that or I should yeah. definitely be in that conversation. Yeah. And that makes a difference because you see it, but you're like, should I really go? Am I really part of that? Does this make a lot of sense? Yeah. And so you like really reaching out and having, like you said, that kind of one-to-one -one conversation and engagement is what makes a big difference. Yes, you and, know, and, as well. and, and one of the students um, was interested in going kind of into consulting or maybe doing a master's program here, started researching with us and decided, oh, I'm gonna do a PhD. This is exciting stuff. So mm -hmm. she's gonna go UC Irvine in the fall. Oh, that's wonderful. Another student yeah. is um, working on deciding about where he wants to go for master's, but is applying here as well. And so mm -hmm. he's, you know, super ambitious, involved in many different things. And um, yeah, there's both the situation where we get really ambitious students that are already doing a lot of things and they add this to their um, CV. But I also really want, to get people who don't know at all. Mm -hmm. And maybe they they don't quite know that they have the aptitude and the skill and mm -hmm. you know the insights to provide research um, you know, um, uh, contributions as well. And, uh, and that really excites me as like kind of the, the next phase of um, that capacity building. Because mm -hmm. it's really great to work with people that are really, you know, already have that 
mm-hmm. intuition for it. But it's also cool to see people go from not really knowing or seeing how they could be a part of it to really being excited by it. Exactly. And it so. seemed like a little that was a little bit of your experience as well. Yes. Yeah. You yeah. Know, so. From moving from that place of not really knowing, but then really like, oh, actually. Yeah. And then also connecting again to the experience that you had with your dad being a construction yeah. worker, right? Yeah. Like in terms of, because all of that also is so dependent on soil and mm-hmm. so dependent on like the land and, mm-hmm. and all those pieces, mm-hmm. like really understanding that um, becomes like really critical for the work that happens. I mean, cause there's been all those examples of also, you know, sometimes the collapse of certain things or mm-hmm. sinkholes or all kinds of stuff that just really wasn't really um, thoughtful in the engineering mm-hmm. of how did that take place, yeah. you know, and so forth. So, well, yeah. thank you, Christian. Thank I you. really appreciate it for making time. I mean, I, yeah, it's my I, pleasure. I want, <laughs> I actually was looking at your, um, your research lab, yeah. you know, page and yeah. so forth. Yeah. And I have to say, I love all the photos of you oh, thank being, you. Yeah, the, yeah, in the field and yeah. doing the work and you, you just look so happy. And so it's, like, it's just sort fun. of excited to be in those yeah. spaces. Yeah. Um, which is wonderful to see because I think that also is inspiring for others, mm-hmm. you know, um, and I'm hoping, you know, at some point that maybe, uh, well, I'll take a look at your articles. I will, they probably will be like way beyond, <laughs> you know, I can, but I'm sure there's like nuggets there that I can maybe, uh, definitely understand. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, I just really w- wish you a lot of luck as you continue moving forward with your research and Thank the work that you're doing. And I love the idea of also working around here as yeah. well because I think there's a lot of possibilities yeah. in this area too yes you yes. know and a lot of connections and I'm yeah. are you building connections with folks or th- in terms of just like the work that you're you're doing yeah one yeah. of my students who's graduating now in the summer Cielo Sharkas has worked a lot with Nuestras Raices here um, just you know work to get a relationship with them and see what it is that they were interested in intrigued mm-hmm. about and they're interested in you know how the flows are you know going to affect operations in the farm or operations yeah, in the community finca. gardens they have la finca here. yeah and so she has done some you know some workshops with them community listening sessions um storytelling and and that was cool to kind of be able to guide her through that process but she's also super motivated worked with the elevate energy equity transition mm-hmm. program mm-hmm. had a lot of mentors there and really yeah. made it her own um and so we have that um collaboration here. Um, we work with the Friends of Lake Warner and Amherst. We work with Department of Conservation and Recreation in the state of Massachusetts. So mm-hmm. I really do enjoy kind of the local uh, stakeholder work, but I'm also excited uh, uh, to get back to Ethiopia and Colombia and Ecuador um, and just start up new collaborations there as well. Because yeah, the, the in the field stuff is really exciting. And then also when you can see in another country mm-hmm. and just see, wow, these are the differences mm-hmm. that we might not understand that we mm-hmm. have in the u.s and how much you know changes are, are needed in this mountainous community or mm-hmm. this other place um so yeah actually that reminds me that um when i was in sabbatical joseph and i went to bogota and we met up with some oh, friends cool. that were there nice. and they took us to a community right outside the city that were looking at water flows yeah but one of the things oh. that they were really trying to work on is how to get the young people really interested in um, that part of um, how to get them interested in in really like what's the word I'm looking for um, in some ways treating the water as sacred mm. you know what I mean as something yeah. that is that is not just sort of this resource but mm-hmm. something that's beyond just being a resource itself yeah. because it had like a lot of generational impact mm-hmm. on the community itself mm-hmm. so it was just like so beautiful to see the way that we, they were all coming together and inspiring the, the elders were inspiring the young people to really sort of think about water conservation. And yeah. and, and it was very also indigenous driven, mm-hmm. you know, like in terms of using engineering sort of practices, but that were very much rooted in the community. Yeah. So yeah. that was that was just inspiring and yeah. really amazing to see. And, and your work kind of reminds me, I know you're not doing that specifically, but it reminds me of the, the possibilities and the connections yes. in that way. Yeah, totally. Yeah. yeah, I think there's a lot of stuff going on now in uh, parts of, Africa and Colombia and Ecuador that call them water funds Mm -hmm. that they are trying to get more connection to people to valorize the work that people in these remote areas are doing to actually help water to be present Mm -hmm. like the work that they're doing to either do conservation or you know not pollute certain streams Mm -hmm. to actually then it goes into the big metropolitan area yeah and that kind of originated in some places where you know that's d- all due to their caretaking mm-hmm. and so that's, exactly. that's cool to exactly. see well, yeah. you know water is, is life right yeah. 
Aguas Vida. You know, yeah. as he said. So, well, thank you, Christian. Thank you, know, you thank very you, much. Christian, for being yeah, here. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for listening in. Yeah. And uh, we'll see you again very soon.